Eternal Moments: Stories of Life and Love by Guido Bruno. Illustrations by Clara Tice. New York, 1920. Eternal Moments. Copyright 1920 by Guido Bruno. Table of Contents: Eternal Moments in a Doorway. Intermezzo, but the world is ours, beloved. Memories, the sorrow of the little violet. Eva Maria, adultery on Washington Square. Jesus on Main Street, the nun and the prostitute. Eternal moments, strange moments, often break the monotony of the universe. The gods marry in their heavens, banish the clouds from the firmament, and charm peace throughout the atmospheres. The skies are wondrously placid, and gentle breezes, the kind messengers of mystical worlds. Cities seem less black and tedious. People become meaningless. We feast on the crumbs that have fallen from the rich tables of the gods. Memories of the past ages play in our unconscious minds. Reflections of a happiness we once felt enkindled our souls, like sweet smiles that flit over the features of beautiful sleeping children. Then meteors may pass through the air, or shooting stars flame across the sky. Or we may think of a dear friend long forgotten, and feel his nearness. Perhaps we thrill with an unknown longing for something marvelous and unknown. We may be moved to sadness or joy without apparent reason, or wild desires for adventure obsess us. We lose our everyday identity again. We become ourselves of centuries ago. We are eternal atoms. Of an everlasting universe, we feel the beginning and the end of all. We are unconsciously conscious of our close relations with the worlds and gods and creations. It lasts for seconds only, but during those seconds, veils are lifted from futures past, arrive from their tombs, and walk within us. Seconds of godly. Godlikeness. He had come from somewhere in the world, and she had come from another somewhere. They met in some place where people meet. They had never seen each other before their eyes met. Both were tall and handsome. She liked him, and he liked her. She smiled, and he smiled, and both went out into the world a pair. They talked across the table, some table somewhere. They were unconscious of the place. His eye fondled her hands. She loved his voice. She told him her life. Realities became unreal. Dreams shaped words. Words lured deeds. He forgot dreams, worlds, problems. A life was erased. Desire overpowered dreams. Strangled logic. Her words seemed to come from far away. He listened as one listens to the murmuring of the sea, of the fascinating, calling, all-absorbing sea. At last, he spoke. I always have loved you. I will always love you. I love you. I love only you. Come with me. Come with me now. At once, let us forget what was. Let us forget everybody and everything. Let us start life anew together. She smiled. It was a happy smile, but she went away somewhere, where she had come from. In the most disreputable part of the town is a forlorn tavern. On the first floor is a room with dirty walls and four bare tables and uncomfortable straight-back chairs. Here they meet again. And a thousand little sons were dancing through the dirty window panes, and playing about their faces. Or perhaps they weren't 
sunbeams. Perhaps they were halos of saints tossed by the holy ones in a merry game of quoits. Forlorn taverns are ideal meeting places for saints, not unusual playgrounds. When they feel like enjoying a rousing game at Halo Coits, she spoke, a confessing Magdalene. He listened humbly. He understood. It was his own story. She spoke of herself. He thought of both of them. Their lips meant, met. He drank her soul. She knew not then that she had unlocked for him her inner self. She knew not that she possessed an inner self. It was a mad kiss, a pledge from soul to soul. She went back somewhere from where she had come, hundred miles of journey, and he went away, far away to the somewhere of his own destiny. A week had passed. At midnight, a message came. I am in your somewhere. I am waiting for you. Come to meet me at once. I want you. He went. They became one. Weeks of doubt, weeks of love, weeks of desire to possess, to possess forever, and at last to possess exclusively forever. I want you forever and ever and ever, she said. I loved and wanted you the very moment I saw you first, was his reply. A tiny cabin on a steamer, the sky with many curious stars, water all around, and on the far horizon, lights dancing in the night like glowworms in June. She said, I was always afraid of water, but tonight I love it. Cities, railroad trains, hours of happy solitude, moments of thoughts of others, not remorse, the feeling. We don't like to hurt them. Oh, God, why must they exist? But they did exist, and both had to go back to them. She somewhere away where she had come from. He to the somewhere where his past called him. One night, a message came to him a message from 1,500 miles away. We have made plans, but I want you. I want you now. Come at once. And he went. 1,500 miles he went, his heart singing to the pumping, the piston rod. He, His heart was light. She calls me. She loves me. He arrived. She was not there. Doubt, suspicion, a heart rent with pain a mind filled with longing, and a body in agony. She came, harmony, love, a long, long stretch of unity. His soul was hers. Her soul leaned over to him and fell back for moments, back to the somewhere where she had come from, back to the people whom she wished not existing, Love, truth, duty, love again, desperate love, resignation, duty, so much love and such severe duty. Doubt, black doubt, a ray of hope, a future full of hope, a long passion, way with many stations to stop and dry away tears, to carry the burden on to another station, to cry and to dry the tears. Love, pain, Is there a goal at the end of the passion way? A pang, a pain. Goodbye. Is there a goal at the end of the passion way? He is back to the somewhere where he had came from. She is back to the somewhere of her world. He wanders, and she wanders, and she wonders. Is there a goal at the end of the passion way? There are moments in life of each human being We are better men and better women for such moments. In a doorway. It was raining and raining on a late Sunday afternoon, once years ago in London. I have forgotten the name of the street, but it was a rather stately-looking row of stone mansions whose doors were shut and undoubtedly locked. The house on the corner of the... 
of the narrow side street was gray. Window boxes with with withered plants distinguished it among all others. The shades of the window were yellow and drawn. The house seemed unoccupied, but strangely, the very large doors were wide ajar. The doorway was a welcome refuge for me as I hurried without an umbrella to the nearest tube. Many men and women with rain-wet coats stood over the doorway, in the doorway, which led to a courtyard deserted as well as the other part of the house. Some of the men were pacing up and down nervously. Some were near the door looking up the clouded skies, which poured continuously enormous buckets of water on a for once whitewashed sidewalk. Others exchanged commonplaces about their unfortunate experience to have been caught in the rain just this afternoon while they had been in a hurry to get to some place or another where their presence was most necessary. Still, others were on the outlook for a cab. Against the gray wall leaned a girl in a green raincoat. She had a red hat and, lo and a lot of obstinate blonde hair. She stood there lazily. She seemed to be real happy, watching the raindrops that splashed across the stones of the sidewalk or looking up to the roof of the house across the street from where the little waterfalls poured. She seemed to enjoy it. She seemed to enjoy the impatience and the wrath, and the anger of her fellow refugees. And for a long while she observed, with happy contentedness, the tree in the backyard of the house, with its naked branches and the stone bench beneath it. She had big blue eyes. She smiled as our eyes met. I looked at her for a long time, into her eyes. Her smile vanished slowly and scarcely noticeably, before she turned to the dripping umbrella of a new arrival. Our eyes met again, just for one moment, and then someone whom she knew came with an umbrella, and she left. I did not look into her eyes for longer than a small fraction of a minute, but it seemed to me like a long lifetime, with all its longing, its promises, its disappointments, its joy, with its inevitable parting. Years have passed, but often of a rainy afternoon, or in the twilight of a quiet hour, or in the radiant sunshine of a glorious summer day, do I think of her big blue eyes and beneath her blonde curls and her red hat. <clears throat> Intermezzo. The two men sat in the summer house back of the big residence. It was dark. The white candle on the table flickered in insufficient yellow light. Not a star shone in the clouded skies. A big, ugly moth did her best to commit suicide in the flame of the candle. The air was laden with heaviness. It was one of the nights that we declare our love, that we exchange confidences in which we regret lost chances and resurrect dead memories. The man with the sad, almost mourning look broke the silence. And so I gave up because of my real, eternal, never-changing love. I never thought that I could do it. But love wins. I watched her closely. I tried to understand every one of her actions. I indulged her eccentricities. I felt her pains. I watched over her day and night. And her husband was always at hand. Your life has been simple, my dear fellow. You don't know what it means to love a woman, to receive favors from her, all those small and big favors that make life worth living. And then you have to say good night every evening. You have to make appointments to meet at this and that place when you know she should be with you all the time. There were her children. It's a funny thing about those children. Wouldn't you expect rather strange, even hard feelings towards the living testimony of her devotion to another man? But no, they seem to be a part of her. I love the children almost as much as herself. We went on this way for months. Women are such masters at burning life's candles at both ends. They know that the two lights must meet sometime and that then there will be darkness but they don't think. They don't feel the creep of the inevitable shadow. We met every day. We lived, we kissed, we loved, 
God, the torture of it. When I sat evening after evening in my quiet quarters with her picture in front of me, and she, I don't know what she was doing. I only imagined. I believed in her with all my heart. She loved her home, the old furniture so carefully selected by her and for her, the old servants upon whom she depended. She hung with all her soul upon every day routine of living that she had followed for so many years. I was now a new factor in the old routine, a beloved one, but still an addition. Well, I gave her up. I gave it all up. I didn't have the heart to induce her to leave the surroundings she loved. I know she would have been willing to do the conventional thing, but I didn't dare do it. I loved her so much I sacrificed everything for her sake. Life is worthless for me. I'll never see her again. I'll never again feel the warmth in my heart. I'll never see her again in my life. And I shall long for her until I die. I might be happy at that if it is happiness, the consciousness of my self-sacrifice. The man said, the man with the sad, resigned face stared out into the darkness. There was a long silence. His companion did not move. It seemed an eternity, but it surely lasted an hour. Neither did his companion take his eyes away from the face of the man who had been speaking. He seemed to try to read his mind and look deep into his heart. He was studying the features of the friend's face, making comparisons. And suddenly, all the relaxation disappeared. He seemed active, dynamic. He leaned back in his garden chair. He stretched his legs and arms, conscious of his powerful, conscious of his strength. There was a vigorous exhalation exhalation from his powerful lungs that blew out the light. Fool? I would have taken her. I would have made only one appointment with her, and that would have lasted for a life. I would have made her forget her surroundings and her furniture. I would have made her sit with me in a, my lonely quarters. I would have brought her happiness. I would have sacrificed everything for her, and conscious of that I would have been happy. A glaring white lightning parted the dark skies. Thunder resounded from all corners of the earth. Heavy drops of an unexpected rain beat against the roof, and the two men hurried back to the big lighted house. 